in your Bibles, if you have them, please turn with me to Luke chapter 2, and I'll be reading for us verses 1 through 20. And if you'd like to follow along, the words will be on the screens in front of you, and they're also in the bulletin. I'll give you another moment if you'd like to turn in your own Bibles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is uh, such a sure way to know you. You have spoken, and Lord, uh, we pray that you would help us to hear. Lord, as your word is read, we pray that we would uh, hear it as your word. A fixed point, something exalted above all other things but your name. Something that we can stake our lives upon. Help us to hear it as a word with authority and meaning and power. And Father, we pray that the preaching that follows, Lord, and as much as it is uh, faithful to your word, Lord, make it useful for us. Lord, make it humbling and edifying. Help us to know something of our Savior and our salvation anew. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 2, the word of God. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, it is Christmas time. It is Advent, as the religious calendars call it. And it is a time when sooner or later, our attention is drawn to Luke chapter 2. We have a tradition in the Birkus family that is now in its third generation at least, where on Christmas Eve, the whole family gathers around where the tree is. And since we're good Norwegians, we celebrate on Christmas Eve and we open all the presents on Christmas Eve. So uh, my kids have never had to have that sleepless night wanting morning to come, which is one reason why the Christmas Eve service, which begins at what time on Christmas Eve? Seven. Ends when? Eight. Am I ever late in that? No. No, we end at eight because my kids would absolutely rebel. They know as soon as we get home, they change in their pajamas, we sit around a tree, before we do anything else, we read Luke chapter 2. 
and I've read this passage now, or it's been read to me just on Christmas Eve 53 times, uh, not counting all the opportunities in Sunday school or churches, and this passage is, in a sentimental way, Christmas for me. But theologically, it is also Christmas. This one chapter gives us the closest and clearest perspective on what happened on that day Jesus was actually born. And what's fascinating to me is what the Bible tells us about. It tells us first about something that's happening on the geopolitical stage. Uh, Caesar Augustus uh, calls for a census of the entire world, the entire Roman world, clearly understood by the context of that. And it's when Quirinius, or perhaps better translated, before Quirinius was the governor, is the first great census of that time. And for that reason, uh, because of something happening on the world stage that presumably you'd think the people of God have no control over, God is bringing this Joseph with his betrothed Mary, who's pregnant not by him, from Nazareth, far up north, the other side of uh, Galilee, all the way down through Samaria to the town of Bethlehem. You ever think about how God uses unlikely people to accomplish his will? We were told that he would come from the north, this great Messiah, and we were told that he'd be born in Bethlehem. How's that going to happen? Well, just as God uses Nebuchadnezzar, God also uses Caesar. God uses unlikely people to accomplish his will. Now, when we get to the scene at the manger, we see that happen again. You know, beginning in verse 8, we read about shepherds. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And I don't want us to fall into the kind of the, the, the dead-end trap of thinking that, well, that's just kind of to create local context or color. Because in many respects, this passage, beginning with chapter 8, has as its focal point the shepherds. What the shepherds are doing, where they are at what time they are, what is said to the shepherds, where the shepherds go, what the shepherds do. And the statement about Mary Potter in her heart is in some respects an aside that's connected to the Magnificat and what follows in Mary's story. But the shepherds are also unlikely servants of an awesome God. I want you to think about those shepherds for a minute. Those shepherds had the graveyard shift. Those shepherds were occupying a role in ancient society that was not particularly well respected. In fact, some ancient writers comment that shepherds are not to be trusted that uh, shepherds were kind of a, a violent uh, subsection of society or culture that was to be dealt with cautiously at best. And I want you to think about people uh, maybe in our world that you'd be a little nervous to be on a back street in the evening when there's not a police car nearby and all of a sudden you realize it's just you and those shepherds. And I'm quite sure that however liberally minded and progressive we are, there are some people that we would rather not be alone with on a dark street at night, far from any uh, law and order. That's, you see, who the shepherds were in the ancient world. And some people might think, well, uh, I've heard, Pastor, that some people think those were shepherds that were watching the temple's flocks. Because you remember at this time, the temple in Jerusalem, which is very close by to Bethlehem, they had special flocks of sheep that were just used for the temple sacrifices, and you're right. But those shepherds weren't Levites. They were shepherds like anyone else, and they were probably getting paid less. 
Because you didn't have to be a very good shepherd to work for the temple. And I'll tell you why. Some of you remember in the teaching of Jesus that Jesus was very critical of some individuals, some Pharisees, some uh, legal experts who, who were saying that they didn't need to support their parents. They're, as their parents get older, you know, in the ancient world, it was the job of the young people to support their parents. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah. Listen, kids. Uh, now, some people were telling others that, well, you know, I, I can't support my parents because anything that I was going to give to my parents, I have dedicated to God. We have the Aramaic words spelled out with Greek letters, is korban, is a gift to God. So therefore, if something's been presented as a gift to God, it can't be redeemed financially. It has to go to God. And so economically, here's what's happened. Now, those folks in that day were as hard-hearted and as small-minded as, as we are today, right? They said, well, I would really like to support you, Dad and Mom, but I made this vow that anything I would give you, I'm giving to God. Now, whenever you dedicated a gift to God, it didn't mean you had to do it right then. So imagine if Bob Bierkus said, Alan and Judy Bierkus, that's my dad and mom, I would love to support you in your old age, but anything I was going to do for you, I've dedicated to God. And sooner or later, I'll give it to God. But right now, I'm letting it build up interest for me in my bank account. Yeah. <laughs> you see, if something is committed or dedicated to God, it cannot be used for any other purpose. Now, what does this have to do with the sheep? If the sheep are given to the Levites to be shepherded, for the temple use. They cannot be used for any other purpose. Therefore, there were laws on the books in those days that any stray or wandering or lost sheep found anywhere within a certain number of uh, miles of Jerusalem was automatically considered to be temple property. How would you like that if you were a private shepherd? You would be very, very careful that your sheep didn't wander. Because if anybody found your wandering sheep, it was instantly temple property. Now, what if you're a temple shepherd? How good of a job do you have to do? Not very good at all. A couple of sheep wander off. Whoever finds them, right back to the flocks. <laughs> so, the argument that, well, the temple shepherds would have been a cut above. You know, I, I have a very, what I would call, Biblically realistic view of human nature. <laughs> I don't think there's any reason at all to believe that those shepherds hired by the temple were the cream of the crop. Very little incentive for them to do a particularly thorough job if they were. Much incentive for private shepherds to be doing a good job. Now, I want you to think about these shepherds for a minute. They're out there doing their job, minding their business. And we read that an angel of the Lord appears and the glory of the Lord shines around them. That would not be an everyday occurrence. That would not be an every millennia occurrence. That would be a once in the history of the world occurrence. And it utterly changes everything they're going to do that night. Now... I want you to follow my uh, narrative stream here and stop thinking about those shepherds and start thinking about Christ for a moment. And what do we know about Christ? We know a couple things about Jesus Christ that should be absolutely fundamental to our understanding of what Christmas is all about. You read that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus Christ existed and was given. The Son of God existed and was given. He was sent from heaven. He came for a purpose. And we know that purpose from texts like John chapter 20 and Luke chapter 19. It tells us that he came to seek and save that which was lost. That's what we read in Luke 19 verse 10. When Jesus is, uh, uh, his actions with respect to visiting and meeting with Zacchaeus that tax collector who was hated and despised in his day, uh, Jesus came to seek and to save people on the fringes just like that. He came to seek and save the lost. 
That is a shepherding metaphor. The lost sheep of Israel is a prophetic word to describe people wandering about, separated from God, and headed in the wrong direction. And Jesus Christ came to seek them. And when we think about Jesus and his coming, we often think about incarnation. Now, incarnation is a big word that, uh, for example, I know most of you know what carne asada is. Right? Carne, same thing, meat, flesh. Uh, incarnation means that the Son of God took on our flesh. He became incarnate. He became, remember, God is a spirit and is worshipped in the spirit and in truth. John chapter 4 tells us that. You know, God doesn't have a, a body like us. He's infinite, eternal, uh, omnipresent. He, he, he's not a biological life form like we are. But in the incarnation, God, the Son from all eternity, puts on flesh, and in a sense is encased or imprisoned in flesh in ways that we just boggle at. The limitations involved. <coughs> He became flesh for us, and that is a great Christmas mystery and, and uh, marvel. But when we think about Jesus coming and being made flesh, we think mostly about his incarnation and what that means for his being. I want us to think for a minute about the fact that because of that first Christmas when Jesus Christ came, there was also a sense not just of incarnation, of being, but a sense of mission or purpose or location. One of my favorite uh, Christmas carols we sang last week, I think, um, Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for our sakes became as poor. Sapphire paved courts with golden splendor. He leaves all that for a manger. And we think about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Logos, that's the theological, the Word made flesh from John chapter 1, leaving heaven and coming to earth. You see, Christmas is all about mission. He came to seek and to save the lost. And then when we read in John chapter 20, when Jesus is giving his disciples sort of their marching orders, he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. We, we read a lot about incarnational ministry, and that means that if you're going to minister to a certain type of people, you need to become like them. Earlier this morning, I was talking with a band and praying before the worship service, and our very fine bass player, John, was talking about Jonathan Edwards. And did you know that Jonathan Edwards, uh, when he left his big pulpit, he kind of had an unsuccessful ministry there in many respects, and went to Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It was a small church. It was in the back country. It was uh, not particularly a, a, a plum assignment, you'd say, right? And he was told there were, uh, the, the Stockbridge at the time was divided into two places. There was like a hilly section where all of the New Englanders lived. And then there was the, the, the floodplain of the riverbank where all of the Native Americans lived. I can't remember, the, with, not the Abenakis, but another tribe. And it was one town, but you had the Indians. And you had the people up on the hill. Where do you think Jonathan Edwards built his house? On the floodplain. With the Indians. And he learned their language. He pursued an incarnational ministry. And we think about that a lot. Incarnation. Become in every way the gospel permits you to. Like the people you're going to reach but we should also think about going. And we even see a little bit of that with Jonathan Edwards in deciding, I'm going to live on this other side of the river. I want you to think about how these shepherds show us four things that help us understand what Jesus did for us on Christmas and help us understand how we can be Christmas shepherds ourselves. So, in order to remember them in the right order, I need to look at my notes. Okay, the first one I have is promptly. These shepherds promptly 
execute their Christmas mission promptly. These shepherds hear this message from heaven. They hear the angel host, probably a military formation, not a choir, saying, Glory to God in the highest, the great battle shout of heaven. And they say, when the angels went away, they say, let us go to Bethlehem and see. And they go. Same night. And they see the baby wrapped in strips of cloth lying in the manger. And then they also go to tell others. And then they return. All in the scope of one night. They're prompt. They understand the importance of the message that was given to them and the significance and therefore importance of that message as it relates to others. I want you to think, dear Christian, when you hear the summons to come to Christ, when you first had it uh, register in your consciousness that yes, you are living in a sin-darkened world and lo and behold, you're a sinner just like Pastor Bjorkus and you need a Savior and today a Savior has been born. When that message first connected with your soul, there is nothing that would have stopped you from going to the side of Christ and putting your faith in Him and repenting of your sins. One thing that's true of Western Christendom, at least in our generations, is that lots of things prevent us from then taking the second aspect of the shepherd's example and going and telling others. You see, the shepherds do all in the space of a night. They promptly go, and I, I've heard a lot of times, yeah, but pastor, you know, you're a, you're a pastor. You've been to seminary three different times. Uh, you know, you've been preaching for 30 years. You, you know, it's, it's easier for you. It's not my, you know, I've, I've heard it all, and believe it or not, I've said it all. I want you to think about another character from the Gospels who's every bit as undesirable in their day and age as the shepherds, the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John chapter 4, a woman who is living with any, had had any number of husbands and living with someone out of wedlock and was a Samaritan. A uh, lot of scholars think that she was drawing water from the well way after the time other people would because she was sort of uh, an undesirable and didn't want the awkward conversations and hostile looks. And Jesus offers himself to her as a source of living water. And Jesus communicates to her that he is the expected, long-expected Messiah. And he offers fellowship and relationship with her, and she puts her faith in him. And we read something fascinating about that woman. We don't know her name, but we know that she left the slopes of Mount Gerizim, went down to that little Samaritan town of Sychar, and that she told everybody, this man told me everything about myself. Now, that's shorthand. That's a very short message, right? But what she did was she told her compatriots, fellow community citizens, neighbors, friends, enemies, that the Messiah is here, and he knows everything about me. Everything. And he still shared a cup of water with me. He accepts all who come to him. And many, we read from that account in John chapter 4, put their faith in Jesus. She didn't have theological education. She simply knew what she had heard and told somebody else. And look at what these shepherds do. When they saw it, verse 17, when the shepherds saw the babe lying in the manger, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. You see, the secret to evangelism is not the right training program. The secret to evangelism is just tell someone what you know. And if you only know a little bit, tell them a little bit. If you know a lot, tell them a lot. I know people who know a lot and are wildly unproductive in their evangelism. I know people who know very little and are hugely productive. But I don't know anybody who's productive who doesn't try at all. The shepherds promptly tell others what they know now. And they do so in a manner 
that is inconvenient. Think about those shepherds for a minute. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. How many of you like to be uh, awakened in the middle of the night? Any takers? How many of you uh, like waking other people up in the middle of the night? How many of you would bless the name of someone who woke you up in the middle of the night because your house was on fire? Yeah. Yep, I would. I'd be real happy about that because me, I'd probably burn to death. That's the ice. When I fall asleep, I'm pretty much comatose. I'd be very grateful. <laughs> and I want you to think about how we live in a world of people who are spiritually comatose. And how our houses are on fire. And... There is no inconvenient time to tell someone that. But yet we have accepted the notion that it's almost always an inconvenient time to talk about spiritual matters. Think about all of the other inconvenient reasons associated with what these shepherds might do. They're not very likable people, according to the received wisdom, right? Just like the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, not a particularly likable person. Should that be any detriment? Let's be honest, are we all likable? I know I'm barely likable, and that's putting it kindly, right? That is no excuse. That's no reason not to share with someone what you know now. Now, we all need to work on being likable, but let's not rest in the fact that we all have quirks and personality warts, if you can put it kindly. The inconvenience should be no deterrent. Persistence. <coughs> I know many, many a Christian has been dissuaded from sharing the gospel with anybody because they had an experience that was really bad. They shared the gospel with somebody and they lost a friendship. They shared the gospel with someone and they got ostracized. They talked about their faith someplace and they either didn't get a job or lost a job. Now, when I read about the shepherds here, it strikes me as significant that we read in 18, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And I want to emphasize two words, all and wondered. Okay, first of all, it's nighttime. And in ancient Palestine, we know that at nighttime you closed your door. Jesus even tells parables about this, about the man who comes beating on the door in the middle of the night saying, I need bread, I had guests arrive from far away. And Jesus tells a parable, but you're not going to open the door because you love that neighbor. You're going to open the door because they're persistent and you want to get back to sleep, so you give them the bread to get rid of them, right? That's the parable Jesus tells. But it underscores the reality that pe people did not then and they do not now like to be interrupted in the middle of the night. Now, these ancient uh, shepherds, it's highly unlikely that they went out, blew a trumpet, sounded a gong in the town square, if there was such a thing, and said, hey, everybody, come here. Everybody gather around. It's far more likely that they went around like old town criers up and down each one of the streets individually, getting people's attention, knocking on doors, sharing a message. All is a big number, not a few. And they wondered. It doesn't say they believed. They wondered. Some translations put, they were amazed, which is a word that can be translated with anything from the sense of awe, in the sense of, wow, that's great news, I'm blown away, to fear, like, what are you talking about? Don't disturb me. It's a broad word. And after a night of this, with no doubt the mixed reviews that attended even the ministry of Jesus himself, they returned to the manger to worship. I want you to think about how often it is the case that we share the gospel with someone and it is incredibly awkward. It is an experience that we would tend to want to characterize as being a negative experience. We feel like, well, they're probably not going to ever want to get a cup of coffee with me again. Or, well, there goes that friendship. And we allow ourselves to do that less and less and less. And ultimately, dear Christian, who is happy with that? Not you. 
Not the people that need to hear about the Lord. Not to put too fine a point on it, but I think the only person happy with that is Satan himself. Now, yes, you can become a nag if that's all you ever talk about with someone. But it should always be adjacent to your conversations. You should always be looking actively for opportunities to give glory and honor to Christ. I'll tell you, some people are critical of athletes who in interviews say, first I'd like to give thanks and praise to God. You ever seen that on interviews? I admire that because they're bringing him into the conversation. And they are taking risks to do that. And some of the risks that they're taking to do that in persistently bringing Christ in a conversation involve the fourth thing we see in these shepherds, sacrifice. What were these shepherds supposed to be doing? Watching their flocks by night? What did they spend the night doing? <laughs> Dennis got it right, but he's an elder, so it's required. <laughs> but uh, I want you, have you ever thought about that? Thought about the fact that here are these shepherds taking a tremendous risk. They understand the history shattering uh, significance of this event. And they say to themselves, well, the sheep are going to be okay for a night. And they do what is more important. And I can't tell you how often it is the case that we as people today find almost everything more important than the actual sheep that Jesus came to save. The human souls that are drifting without reconciliation with God, forgiveness of sins, the sure hope of life everlasting. And brothers and sisters, there's nothing more important than that. Nothing. Imagine for a moment that, let's just set this up as a kind of a rhetorical device, just ask you to answer this in your head. On the one hand, you have your job, which provides for you nicely. It uh, gives you a place and a role in society and some level of esteem or respect, at least in your career field. And on the other hand, you have the soul of a co-worker who is, doesn't, know, doesn't know Christ. If, this is a rhetorical question, if you knew for a fact that sharing the gospel would be used by God to bring them to salvation and they would be in heaven forever, but you'd lose your job, would you do it? I just want you to think about that. Because so many of us wouldn't. And we'd say, well, I'm a, I'm a Calvinist. If God's going to save me, he's going to do something else. Or I don't want to take that risk. There's got to be another way. And you see, when I think that way, even about some of the passions I have, and it's been pointed out to me that I love coaching a lot, and that is no lie, I love it. And I love the kids and the families that I work with coaching. No, nope, make no mistake about it. But would I risk all of that by talking about Christ on a public high school campus? I do that every single week. Because if even one of those kids, one of those parents, comes to know Christ, that's worth my entire... I give up fishing. I give up the NFL. I give up lacrosse for one soul. And if we were that soul thirsty, if we put that kind of a premium on the eternal value of one soul, I think we would all be a little bit different. We'd all be willing to knock on doors in the middle of the night, metaphorically speaking, at the very least. Because I want you to think about what Christ did for you. In the fullness of time, the Bible tells us Jesus came, he came promptly. We read in Isaiah and his servants' songs that the, the, the Messiah says, Here I am, send me. The minute the question is asked, who shall go? 
send me. The Son of God from all eternity promptly came to secure your eternal salvation. What about inconvenience? Could you imagine being free to be and go anywhere in the universe you wanted to? And accepting the constraints of the human limitations of a physical body? Could you imagine not being subject to any of the effects of the fall? The fall being that great catastrophe in which our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, sinned and all of a sudden became liable to, to anger, to bitterness, to jealousy, to disease, to violence, to crime, to want. All of a sudden, Jesus goes from God in very nature to having the flu as a baby, being hungry in the wilderness, weeping at a friend's death, being rejected by people he came to help. We don't know anything about inconvenience unless we begin to study what the Son of God did for us. What about his persistence? Sabbath after Sabbath, going to synagogues, opening the scrolls of the prophets, and preaching about the kingdom of God, being asked to leave towns, being cursed, being rejected, being debated, being scorned, being crucified. He never stopped. Remember when Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Remember that? He was so persistent that he never bothered to buy real estate. He was constantly on the move. Persistence and sacrifice. He gave himself. This Christmas, like every Christmas, I'm going to sit around my tree with my kids and we'll probably have some uh, Christmas music on softly in the background and Pippin will be sniffing at all the packages hoping she finds some burger cookies from Baltimore to eat. And I will read Luke 2. And as I read Luke 2, I'm going to be hoping that I will be a Christmas shepherd. That I will promptly talk about the Savior. When it's inconvenient, persistently, even if it costs me. And I would invite you, dear Christian, to join me in that. You know, when we look at the history of the church and note times of revival, the times of revival that sweep the church, even in the day of Edwards in the First Great Awakening or uh, Finney in the Second Great Awakening, yes, men like great preachers, Whitfields and Edwards, Spurgeons, they're used to do great things. But by far, the vast majority of the people who are affected in those seasons of spiritual renewal are affected by laymen and women, simple Christians, sharing what they know with whomever they can. You know that during the First Great Awakening, when Jonathan Edwards is, by historians and theologians, credited with being such a leader in that movement, you know how big his congregation was? How big? Do you, how many people do you think Jonathan Edwards preached to during the First Great Awakening? Throw out a number. Pretend you're not Presbyterians. Fifty. What's that? Fifty. That's actually about right. But we have it in our mind that he must have preached to thousands. Whitfield did, not Edwards. But those people that heard him shared with someone else. And that church never had to rebuild a bigger sanctuary. It was a small town. But Christianity is a lay movement. Let's be lay people and get out there and share the gospel. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. Well, that was an okay amen. <laughs> and one thing you can do, is we do have our Christmas Eve service coming up. Uh, on Christmas Eve, lo and behold, makes sense, doesn't it? 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. On Christmas Eve, I'm going to be sharing a simple message, a very simple message, and the message is going to be what the shepherds saw. That's the message, what the shepherds saw. It's going to be a very simple Christmas gospel message. Come. 
and, uh, and bring some. Amen? Amen. And if I don't see you, Merry Christmas. <laughs> God is good, and you are dearly, dearly loved. Please join me in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, we ask that you would bless us. Lord, help us to be Christmas Christians. Like those shepherds, Lord, help us to be uh, prompt and uh, help us to be persistent, to overcome inconvenience and to make great sacrifice. Lord, help us do whatever we can to seek and to save the lost. Uh, Lord, as, as powerful means of grace to another Lord. Uh, Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Christ and gave him for us. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that because of your great love for us, you did not scorn the, uh, the cross, but Lord, you, you reigned from it. And oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you deigned to live in our hearts by faith and uh, uh, convict us, compel us, comfort us, guide us. Oh, triune God, we thank you for your work in our lives, and we ask that you would continue it. Uh, please continue it. Grow us. Help us to become more like, like our Savior. We, we pray these things in His name. Amen. Amen.